Uh, hi everyone, my name's Helen Fogarty and I'm part of the NAPCAN team. We're the National Association for Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. I'm really excited to welcome you to this webinar. Um, it's called Play, Participation and Poverty, How Our Policies Can Create Fairer, Healthier Futures for Children and Young People. Uh, firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of this beautiful land. Um, I live and work on the lands of the Toolbal and Yagara people, Mianjin, Brisbane. It's land that was never ceded, always was, and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd also, of course, like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that to Elders from all the lands you're um, watching from today. I know we've got people from all over Australia. Um, and of course, welcome any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander colleagues who are logged on today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the big feelings that um, a, lot, a lot of us have are experiencing around the voice and reiterate our commitment to work, working alongside First Nations people for a better future. And in particular, listening to the voices of First Nations people, including the children and young people. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, anyone who was um, already on the Zoom while we were getting ready, you'll know where we're not super expert at, at these things, but um, there is the, the webinar will be recorded firstly so don't worry about that if you if you weren't able to attend if you know people who aren't able to attend we'll be sending that out to everyone who registered and we'll also be putting it on our website um you can put your questions in the chat we should have some time at the end for questions um although we do have a lot of really interesting um uh sort of content to get through the most of the present i think the presenters all have slides and we will be able to share those slides as well um, and we'll add, we've already added and we will be adding a few links to the chat so on about other activities and things that are happening. So on with the webinar, um, as we said in the blurb about this webinar, um, this has really come about because Anti-Poverty Week and Children's Week overlap at the moment in October. And so Anti-Poverty Week is focused on how we can end child poverty in Australia. And despite being one of the richest countries and by some measurements, the richest country in the world, we still have one in six children in Australia living in poverty. Um, so this, of course, impacts children and families in many ways. We know from children themselves, from the work that people like um, Dr. Sharon Bessel have done, that while we tend to immediately think about the material deprivations like food or insecure housing, there are other things that are also important, not to say that those things aren't important. So today we're kind of looking, um, Sharon Bessel talks a little bit about um, the imp impacts on relationships for children. So the people, are, the toxic stress that the people around them experience really impacts their relationships. But of course, poverty also impacts their opportunities to participate. And that's really what we're focused on today. So in some ways it seems like a light topic, but it's actually a really important topic as you'll um, kind of hear as we go through here. Um, it's going to really be a, a lot about how we can kind of think about our systems and improve our systems and our policies to make sort of give every child and every community a fair go. Um, it's something I'm personally really passionate about in terms of that protective factor for young people. And we know that young people um, are doing it tough. Uh, we have the stats from the Australian Child Maltreatment Study. But also in terms of my work with NAPCAN and the primary prevention of child abuse, I'm particularly interested in this intersection because um, it, the belonging and connection is a really important and often overlooked uh, protective factor for families in preventing harm from occurring in the first place. So there'll be a lot of talk about that sort of social capital, the belonging, um, and the, the, the sort of uh, it's really the importance of those things and how play and participation um, link into those things. So, I um, mean, our main work at NAPCAN is about really showing that child abuse is a community issue and that it is preventable. And I think today's discussion will sort of do that in a, in a fresh and interesting way. Um, okay, I've made um, my speakers, my <laughs> speakers here, sit, stand here while I'm, while I'm, sit here while I'm talking. I just wanted to do, we're gonna go through and we're gonna hear from Dr. Alex first and then from um, Rachel and Sally in the Northern Territory and then from Hiano in Queensland. Um, but I just thought we'll just quickly go through so that you all know who you'll be hearing from and you have a little bit of a view to what's happening. So I'll just go um, quickly to um, Alex and, and um, uh, ladies in the NT and then to Hiano, if you don't mind, just a very quick intro and hello. 
Hi, everyone. Um, building off what Helen was saying, I'd like to acknowledge the Palawa people of Lutruita, the lands upon which I stand today and, and live and work. Um, uh, Lutruita is the uh, traditional name for Tasmania, and I'm coming to you from Launceston, uh, where I work for the University of Tasmania doing work on uh, adult Thanks, Alex. That just chopped, that cut out slightly for me, but I don't know if it was okay for everyone else. We might go to Rachel and Sally. For a yeah. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, my name is Sally Weir. Um, I'm the Regional Youth Program Coordinator for both Darwin and Palmerston, um, which is a position within Territory Families in the Office of Youth Affairs. Um, and I'll let Rachel introduce herself, but we too would like to acknowledge that uh, we're living and working on Larrakia country and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, my name is Rachel Fosdick. I'm one of the volunteer founders of Palmerston and Regional Basketball Association, um, which is not a traditional basketball association and we uh, try to deliver sport differently. No, uh I'm Hayano Moser. I'm from the Australian Institute of Play. I'm um, speaking to you from Wanjaraburra country and on the foothills of Tambourine outside of um, just on the on the rim of Logan, where I work and play in the um, in Yugambera and Yagara speaking country. Great. Okay, thank, thanks everyone. Okay, well, we'll disappear and we'll let um, uh, Dr. Alex um, share his, his uh, research with us. Thanks, Helen. So um, it became a. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the end of my introduction was cut off, and I was just saying that, um, as you can see here, I work for the University of Tasmania, where I really specialise in youth developments, specifically focusing on the adolescent or teenage years, and I think about ways that we can get uh, young people to thrive in what is an increasingly difficult and complicated world. One of the areas that I do this is by thinking about, naturally, considering today's topic of conversation, um, ideas of how we can encourage young people to participate within their communities. And often the most, uh, the most common way that young people are doing that is in the form of extracurricular activities. The most common being sport. I think around 70% of all adolescents play sport in this country, but other forms of um, artistic like dance, drama, musical instrument, as well as um, academic like chess club, debating, uh, and community groups like cadets and so on. Specifically, what I really want to talk to you about today is the intersection between the impact that all of those different um, community and activity engagement has for young people, while thinking about the intersection of socioeconomic status, uh, experiences of poverty, low income, um, and living in regional areas. To do that, I've got this uh, maps ab above my head at the moment. The one to my left is the Gold Coast, where I grew up, and the one uh, directly above me is Adelaide, where I spent some time working at Flinders University. Overlaid onto these maps is indicators of community-level socioeconomic status. This is what the Australian Bureau of Statistics compiles together uh, in terms of averages within different suburbs for income, um, as well as other indexes like how many homes are connected to the internet, whether or not children have access to their own rooms you know, within these households. And the reason why I like to show these maps is because it's really quite uh, important to point out that even though all these different communities um, have, you know, a graded slightly different colours uh, on the map, they're actually quite closely connected together. There's main roads that you can see sort of in the background that connects them. And what I like to point out is that actually when we think about the life outcomes of young people, when we think about the way that they grow and they develop, the opportunities that they're provided will vastly differ depending upon where they are on this map. And so even relatively close proximity to one another, there can still be quite stark differences in terms of life opportunities. As a further way of background, I've got this graph here, which shows um, the proportion of uh, guaranteed income, so welfare support in Australia, relative to other OECD countries across time. 
Helen pointed out in this introduction that we are a wealthy country and that there are, um, you know, resources in order to go round. And at the turn of the millennium, we actually had one of the most generous welfare schemes um, in or in terms of OECD countries. But over years, successive governments have um, dwindled that away. And other than that sort of spike that you saw around COVID with the introdu introduction of um, uh, JobKeeper, uh, we were essentially now on par with most other OECD nations. But I'm of the opinion, and as are many others, that when we think about inequities in our society, particularly focusing on things like education and health, these inequities, they're not inevitable and they are not predestined. And in order to highlight this, I really think like to step back and think about, well, what is it that's driving the association between socioeconomic status and a range of different outcomes in our society? Um, in order to do that, we need to think about, well, money doesn't, you know, it doesn't provide nutritional value. You can't eat it. And as the saying goes, you know, money can't buy happiness. But actually what it what it does do, and this is, you know, I'm assuming not a shock to many of us, is it can provide opportunity structures within our society. It provides um, vehicles with which young people can access a variety of different enriching spaces is that can drive their subsequent development. And as a psychologist rather than a medical practitioner or something of that nature, the ones that I'm typically focusing on is these sort of social aspects and intrapersonal growth. How is it that we can get young people all into positive um, interactions with others as well as within spaces that allow them to grow as individuals? And... Again, unsurprising given the nature of today's talk, the one of the areas that we can do this is through leisure. It's through play. When you encourage young people to engage in leisure-based activities, there's a whole heap of developmental benefits or what I would call developmental assets that go along with that. These activities are typically done with like-minded peers where individuals can reach out and connect with others who they may um, share common bounds. So it facilitates positive peer relations. But also it can provide access to adults outside of the family and outside of school. It can be positive role models. At the same time, it allows for personal growth. Think about the skill that's required that's honed through practice, whether it's sporting skills like kicking a ball or academic skills related to talking to people. And it also encourages growth around things like agency um, and other developmental outcomes. Ultimately, what we want is we want young people to be happy, thriving individuals that can think for themselves and fare, um, and fare okay in the world that they live in. And by the nature of the competitive aspects as well as the social, these activities can really help young people deal with setbacks and losses uh, and thereby building coping skills. They can also um, teach young people about the need to schedule their time and um, look after multiple different um, domains in their life. So when I think about the work that I do and I pull these two strands together, it's important to point out that actually young people who do engage in leisure activities don't do it in a vacuum. They engage in these activities within the broader context of the world around them and the way that they see the world. And this has given birth to what I call is the compensation hypothesis, and others before me have used this phrase as well. And I argue that, well, if the relationship between socioeconomic status and health, education and well-being is driven by access to these sorts of enriching developmental assets. Well, then if we can provide those developmental assets through activities, well, then they will be especially important for disadvantaged youth who may have less access to these um, assets in other domains of their life. Taking that a step further, then we should be able to say, well, vulnerable youth or youth in context of disadvantages will see greater benefits from engaging in these um, community-based activities relative to more advantaged youth. And that is because more advantaged youth are far more likely to have positive outcomes regardless of their participation. Their lives, their schooling, their family, they're typically enveloped in enriching and positive experiences. That means that the things that are really essential to driving outcomes in these leisure activities are probably going to be less important for them. 
I've got a couple of empirical examples to demonstrate this in more depth. So this is data that was collected on um, about four or 500 adolescents um, who were being cared for by resettled refugees. And I've got a simple sort of dichotomy on this bar chart here. The black bar denotes individuals who don't participate in sport. The gray bar indicates um, uh, those who do participate in sport. And the outcome or the averages that you can see here uh, are socio-emotional problems. Essentially, are the, um, are the adolescents, are they um, experiencing sort of internalising symptoms or emotional reactivity, as well as various different what we would call conduct issues, inability to sit still during class and stuff like that. And the three clusters here represent youth who have been resettled in low socioeconomic status, around the medium or, or middle of society's um, socioeconomic status or more affluent areas. And what we can see here is that for individuals who are participating in sport, it doesn't really matter where they have been resettled, right? This is that grey bar there. They've got low levels of social-emotional problems regardless of where they're living. But for those that have been resettled in a low socioeconomic status area, we can see quite disparate socioeconomic outcomes where more disadvantaged young people are experiencing more psychological concerns. Importantly, for those in the high SES community, it doesn't matter if they participate or not. They've got comparable levels um, of well-being. Here's another example. This is looking at a different index of um, what I would call disadvantage, whether or not you're living in the city or in a region. And here, rather than just simply looking at sport v non-sport, I've classified people depending upon how many activities that they've done. So someone may do a team sport, they may do dance, they may do debating, and they would do three or more types of activities. And the outcome that I'm looking at here is um, academic performance, so the Australian tertiary um, admissions rank. And again, you can see that for young people in regional areas, less so for those living in the city, the more that young people do the activities, the higher their academic outcomes are going to be. When we think about this from a real world point of view, I've just taken um, a, a couple of different scores from Deakin because their information was easily available online. And I looked at how these ATAR scores corresponds with how many degrees or how many different programs at Deakin young people can get into. And as we can see, the difference between doing no activities and a, and a couple of activities, particularly in regional towns, opens up dozens of different degree pathways that otherwise wouldn't be available to young people. Here's a final example that I wanted to show you because it highlights something slightly different. And rather than thinking about whether or not people are engaging in activities or how many, in this particular graph, what I wanted to do was look at the, um, whether or not individuals were doing activities for a greater amount of time, whether or not from grade eight through to grade nine, they were continuing on in the same activity demonstrated by grades. So if you're doing basketball in grade nine, eight, are you also doing basketball in grade nine? Then thinking about whether or not people have swapped. So maybe they've gone from basketball into dance or drama, right? So they're still doing an activity, but they've shifted what it is that they're doing relative to those who drop out completely, those who go from doing an activity at grade eight to doing um, no structured leisure time experiences in grade nine. Something that we can straight away point out is that it doesn't really... Um, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're doing the same activity or you're doing a different activity. You've got better outcomes. And I should emphasise here that what we're looking at here is uh, externalising symptoms or risk-taking, sometimes known as delinquency. One uh, has no risk-taking, no delinquency. You're not getting in fights. You're not doing graffiti. You're not missing school. Whereas two would indicate some sort of risk-taking. And so irrespective of whether in the same activity or a different one, uh, and irrespective of where they're living, if you're doing an activity, you're really demonstrating or you're really experiencing the protective influence that these activities can offer. But for, um, for youth who drop out, this is where that typical gradient effect of socioeconomic disparities emerges, where it's those who drop out but live in the low socioeconomic area that are really getting the detrimental effects of withdrawing from these spaces.
For more for kids in more affluent suburbs, it doesn't matter whether or not um, you're participating or not, whether or not you continue or drop out, you're still um, considerably less likely to be engaging in these forms of risk taking. So we've got evidence that uh, activity participation is good for young people, and it's especially good for young people in contexts of disadvantage. But the issue is, is that, well, those that benefit the most are actually also the least likely to participate. There's a whole heap of barriers that are standing in the way of letting young people from low SES communities, from low income households and from the regions being able to participate in these forms of activities. So what can we do about it? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can try to get information by asking young people, why is it that you don't participate and work backwards from there? Here, there's a sample of about 450 young people who don't participate in any activities at the age of 14, and they were asked why. And by and large, the overwhelming majority of young people say they're not interested. Those things that we would typically think about living in the regions or living in a, um, a low SES context, like the cost of an activity or the availability of public transport, doesn't really come up that often. It's, it's mostly about that, that level of interest. But there's a concept in sociology that we talk about a lot, which is around that idea of adaptive preferencing. I don't want to be a millionaire. It doesn't seem like a particularly good lifestyle. I like the way things are now. Well, in actual fact, I'm unlikely to be a millionaire. So that is an adaptive preference that I can report. And actually, when we break down this not interested and focus in on what young people actually say, there's a whole heap of reasons why people aren't interested, which stem from these socioeconomic inequities. Young people from low SES areas, particularly in cities, don't feel psychologically safe getting on a bus and going across town to the, the more affluent suburbs where they may be doing a competition in a private, you know, that's being hosted by a private school where everyone's in a, um, you know, wearing a, a certain uniform. Or maybe maybe they can't do it because they need to work and support their family um, financially, which is less likely to occur in other situations. And so I think that it's important to not only consider youth voices, but also sort of break down, well, what is it that's going on and, and what is it that we can um, extrapolate from the broader literature about why it is that young people in areas of disadvantage are less likely to participate? Well, there is the costs of participation and there is also transportation issues. But from a family point of view, there's also work restraints. If you're looking after multiple children and you've got to travel in multiple different directions which way in order to drop them up and pick them up multiple times a week, that's going to interfere with work, especially if you're a precariously employed shift worker who may not always have control or flexibility in a nine to five working arrangement. Um, from schools and communities, particularly as we get older, there's exclusionary practices where sports clubs in particular are more focused on putting together good teams particularly at the later stage of adolescence and excluding young people who may not necessarily be the most talented. Activities are also made undesirable, or well, particularly, um, you know, anyone who, who has a teenager knows one of the worst things you can do to get them to do something is to just say that it's a good idea. Children and, um, and adolescents are naturally rebellious at, at times, and we need to respect that. But organisations also have a lot of self-interest. As we've seen, doing activities, regardless of what they are, are beneficial. But often from an organisational point of view, they're interested in sort of um, ensuring the longevity of that particular organisation, which is absolutely necessary from their behalf. But when we're thinking about broader social policies, is there are other approaches that can be taken. From Likewise, we can think about, well, the need for... Um, for there to be grounds and spaces which are far less likely to occur in less effluent areas. I would also say that there's too much of an emphasis on sport. Sporting in this country is the backbone of our national identity at times, but actually non-sporting activities is really where the disparities start to emerge in terms of rates of participation. And there's also an emphasis on one-off focused grants for local organisations and less of an emphasis on either continued um, participation across years or times, um, as well as uh, thinking about uh, encouraging um, young people to pursue multiple activities rather than just the one. 
And to put that in example, one of the policies that I like to um, highlight and talk about that I think exemplifies a number of these different issues is sports vouchers. So many different states um, and the Northern Territory as well uh, have sports vouchers where individuals can get between $100 and $200, depending upon the scheme, to put towards the registration of uh, uh, the registration fees of a different sporting organisation. In some instances, uh, they are... Um, in some instances, they're means tested, like in Tasmania, where they're linked to healthcare cards. But in other states like New South Wales, they're not and they're freely available. However, the reason why I point out this policy is because, one, almost all states and territories, with the exception of New South Wales and the NT, explicitly exclude cultural based activities and non sporting activities, again, emphasizing sport. On the other hand, the amounts that they provide are largely insufficient in order to um, cover all the costs of participation. And then finally, the, the, my last issue with this sort of um, uh, scheme is that it's dictated towards one uh, particular time point. It's participation at this point in time, rather than thinking about, well, what strategies can we employ in order to get prolonged participation over a longer period of time? So I'm out of time. But some broader strategies that we can think about is from a family point of view, thinking about, well, how is it that we can carpool? How is it that we can organise transportation and, and cut down, particularly in regional areas, on the distance that we need uh, to travel? We need cross-organisation scheduling at shared facilities. And um, in, in order to facilitate that, we need multi-purpose facilities, which councils are increasingly doing, which is a great move. We need to see community grants based on long-term funding, which I know is exceedingly difficult to do, and almost every community sector will say that we need long-term funding. Um, and my pie-in-the-sky um, idea that will never happen despite the wealth of this country as we make all activities free. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for listening. And I believe there's some Q&A, but we're going to take that at the end. Is that correct, Helen? That's right, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you so much, Alex. That was just such a perfect wrap up of those things. And I, I, I was aware that you were going to sort of frame it in that way and 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 create sort of create that foundation for the story today. But um, you did that like even more amazingly than I, I could have imagined. And um, interesting, the things that you you said are the the ways forward are often the same things that we talk about for all aspects of child wellbeing. So the, the listening to the people that actually affects the, the collaboration between organizations and governments and then the funding structures and all, all and then making things um sort of freely available. So I'm really excited that um Rachel and um or Sally and then Rachel are going to speak because their work really is overcoming so many of those barriers that that you're talking about. Um, so really excited about that. Um, okay, so I'll disappear. I'm going to be sharing um, slides, so fingers crossed, and um, welcome Sally and Rachel. Thanks so much, Helen. Um, we're going to be uh, sharing information and talking about the Palmerston Youth Activity Grant, which is funded through the department, the NT Department of Territory Families, Housing and Communities. Um, since 2018, this funding has successfully provided support to community organisations and partners um, to coordinate and deliver free school holiday and after hours activities in Palmerston. I'm going to discuss the aims of the grant and share the outcomes of an evaluation that was conducted around this grant program. And then Rachel's going to, um, as she introduced herself from uh, Parbison Regional Basketball Association, uh, Parba is a key provider um, delivering the youth drop-in sports program. Rachel's going to present some key outcomes um, from that program and, and share that with the group. Um, firstly, some information about Palmerston for, uh, for people that haven't been here before. Um, Palmerston is the second largest city in the Northern Territory, located about 20 kilometres uh, from Darwin, with a population of around 37,000. Um, it's a diverse community with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders comprising 11% of the population, 
and 30% of residents were born in a country other than Australia. Many young families call this city home uh, with 42% of the population aged under 25. Palmerston, like many communities, has its challenges and concerns of community members um, include youth crime, which was at its peak when this, um, when this youth activity grant program started, um, poverty, domestic violence and access to housing. Um, now onto some background. <laughs> uh, a key message from the uh, from the Royal Commission into the protection and detention of children in the Northern Territory uh, was the need for a public health approach involving prevention, early intervention, and diversion to support young people at risk of entering the juvenile justice system. The Northern Territory government developed safe, thriving, and connected generational change for children and families, which outlined wide-ranging reforms to better support children, families and young people um, who were experiencing vulnerability. This regional youth activity grant program uh, was included in these reforms um, as a preventative and early intervention strategy. So what are the aims of the program? Um, the aims of the program are to support the delivery of after hours and school holiday activities and to ensure young people aged 10 to 17, particularly those at risk, have accessible, safe and fun activities to participate in. The grant was keen to, or uh, the purpose, the aim of the grant was keen to um, ensure that young people are included in the planning, delivery, and evaluation of these activities. We really wanted young people to have a sense of ownership um, around the activities that were delivered for them. Uh, we wanted to link young people with support, uh, use the activities that were provided in the community as a platform to engage, to build relationship with young people, and then to walk with them to access other services, resources, and support if they need. And finally, to develop stronger and more collabor collaborative working relationships with key stakeholders and to improve coordination across the youth and related sectors. That's a key component of the role that I deliver, um, working with key stakeholders and providers to support partnerships, to create responses to issues that are impacting young people in the region and to improve outcomes. There are regional youth activity coordinators and grants available in each of the regions in the Northern Territory. So uh, in 2021, we commissioned uh, useful projects, uh, Gretchen Emmett, um, a local evaluator um, in Darwin to evaluate the grant. We really wanted to find out um, if we were meeting the aims of the grant and to look at, um, at what young people and key stakeholders and community uh, felt the grant was achieving and importantly, uh, for them to share with us ways that we could improve what we were doing. By that time, we had engaged a wide variety of providers, um, including the YMCA, Larrakia Nation, the City of Palmerston Council and independent providers to deliver the activities. The evaluation was conducted through a mixed methods approach using interviews, surveys, observations and analysis of program documentation. And we will provide the link to the, um, to the evaluation report um, on the NatCan website. Uh, the evaluation engaged uh, 40 young people attending activities through um, uh, individual interviews and focus groups. We spoke to 13 activity provider staff, uh, nine community leaders from key community organisations and 118 Palmerston community members. Uh, quick stats, as you can see on the slide, is that um, at the time of evaluation, um, during school holidays, 53 hours of the week were filled with activities. Um, this occurred from uh, 9 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night over school holidays, 
And um, they were delivered by a range of organisations that were providing um, different types of activities that young people could engage with over this time. A key learning early on into this program, which was uh, gained through the collaborative work that we were doing, was the importance of providing meals, uh, coordination and transport for participants. Um, and also the importance that everything that we delivered was delivered at no cost. Um, the grant supported uh, uh, the provision of safe spaces to young people to have fun, engage um, and enjoy a range of activities. So it wasn't just sport. We know that uh, young people like to engage in, in different uh, activities and ways to spend their time. So it included, of course, sport, uh, arts and craft and cultural activities delivered uh, by Larrakia Nation through the Young Mulligas and Kajuis program. Um, the feedback from young people was positive. 100% um, told us that the activities were great or good. Um, young people were having fun at the activities. 93% uh, felt extremely or very safe. And, um, and most young people felt respected from staff. Helen, can you change that slide? Thank you. Um, uh, as I said, we spoke to 118 community members and they too were really positive about the activities, which was great news for us because um, at that time um, and before them, uh, you know, the uh, com community members were concerned about the youth crime and um, it was lovely and affirming that they felt these activities were valued um, and nice for young people to hear that the community valued them and, um, yeah, and supported, um, yeah, them accessing activities and, um, and linking with other services and support. Um, community members noted that um, the activities in increased access as they were free um, and they linked young people with mentors and support. I like this quote um, from a community member, you know, all kids deserve a chance to take part in fun activities in the holidays, regardless of who they are and where they come from. Also, you know, the activities are keeping young fellas out of trouble. So there was a sense that they were contributing to, um, to supporting young people and, um, yeah, making a positive difference in the Palmerston community. Um, a note for us from their feedback was we need to get better at promoting the activities that we're delivering or that are being delivered through providers so that everyone can have access to them. Uh, thanks, Helen. Um, we spoke to service providers and community leaders and they too um, stated that the aims of the grant were uh, being met um, and supported through the coordination and connection between services. Uh, these activities supported positive behaviour in young people and provided opportunities for leadership, links to support and safe spaces. Um, so key learnings for us and how can we improve this program? Uh, the program is, uh, it continues to be funded um, and, um, and we're always looking for ways to, um, to extend what we're delivering. Um, so key learnings continue to strengthen and deliver uh, the range of activities and looking at ways to um, extend that um, and invite other providers into deliver activities is important. Important um, to work uh, within a strengths-based approach um, and to be led by young people. Uh, as I said, we do need to uh, strengthen the way we promote our activities to make sure that everybody has um, information about them. Um, it was recommended that, um, that this grant support the longer term funding for cornerstone activities, which we've actioned since that time and have funded two uh, cornerstone activities for a longer period, which supports sustainability of staff, but importantly, consistency for young people so that they know that those activities will be there on a long term basis. And transport, that is such, it's like an essential component of these programs. Uh, we're lucky this is provided uh, by Larrakia Nation here, uh, which is um, yeah, an Aboriginal community controlled organisation within the local community. 
Uh, key learnings also indicated the importance of scaffolding. It's not enough just to give out funding for providers, some of which have been working with our target group, and some of which are experts working on content, experts at teaching kids how to play tennis, but need some support around how to engage with the target group that we're wanting to engage with. Um, so key learnings are that uh, we need to be uh, connected, uh, we need coordination, a willingness to work together. We're in a room where the light goes off already so um, there you go. <laughs> a willingness to work together, the provision of transport and meals are also essential. Um, and for services such as security when needed, which um which they're a part of our program as well, to be delivered in a youth-friendly, culturally safe manner, as it is through the Mulga Security um, Aboriginal controlled um, uh, Aboriginal run organization. Um, so that's it for me. It's an overview around a grant um, that has been delivered and is continuing to be delivered in regions in the Northern Territory. I'm going to now hand over to Rachel, who will talk more specifically around one program um, that's uh, that's uh, delivering, delivering some great outcomes in Palmerston. Thanks, Helen. Are you up to share my screen? Can we skip slide one? Because it's just a wrap up of the other stuff. Um, sharing. Thanks, Helen. Um, so we started in 2017 in Palmerston um, in our relationship with youth dropping sports. Um, we were running, we set up in 2014 as a basketball association, but decided right from the jump that we would deliver sport differently. <laughs> so our concept was uh, Darwin Basketball run a very good um, basketball program. We just wanted to deliver everything that was missing the gaps. Um, so we wanted to remove all the participation barriers for any child to participate in sport in Palmerston. Uh, we were inside our wonderful recreation centre, which is provided by our local council, uh, and we had an excessive problem with young people breaking into our cars while we were trying to deliver sport. So we opened the door one day and said, what do you want? And they said, we want to come in. So from that day forward, we opened the door. Uh, we met with government who were sensational at providing us options. The grant did start as four small packets of funding, which was Funder Chase, um, and the government, uh, Territory Families, and the government have now committed to four years of funding, which has allowed us to provide this program ongoing, which allowed us to create a partnership with our local council around the venue, which what Alex was speaking about. We have a brilliant location next to um, the bus depot, so the young people come straight from school in the afternoon. Uh, we've removed the participation cost, so it's all free. Um, and we, sorry, Helen, if we go to local challenges, I'm having trouble. Really, I'll speak to that. Um, having a bit of trouble sharing. I don't know what. That's okay. I can talk can without see? slides. Um, <laughs> I can talk underwater. So uh, yeah. part of our thing is we remove all the barriers to participation. So we have um, designed the program. It runs for five days a week, 50 weeks of the year as an opportunity for any young person in Palmerston, regardless of background, to come and participate in sport, which has since developed to um, eSports as well. Uh, it now has a bit of a cultural session. And we, uh, once those doors open, there is no closing them. So our partnership with Council, uh, Larrakia Nation for the transport with their use bus and then Mulga Security around um, culturally appropriate security, uh, has made a, a big uh, impact for us. So the local challenges were making sure we meet our right demographic, but at this stage, um, it's all kids are coming in and the demographic is everybody. Um, we can skip that one too, Helen. So um, as Alex said around the um, barriers, uh, it was drilling down into that uh, very personal question about why the young people weren't coming. Um, and it was around transport. It was around mum and dad not having the capacity to bring them up. Uh, it was around food security. The kids were coming to us hungry from school. And who wants to be active when you're hungry? Uh, so we went back to government with our hand out again and asked if we could have some extra money to provide food. So we provide food every day now. Uh, we have no uniforms. We have mixed gendered age groups. We have anything that we could possibly take away from normal sport, we did. Uh, our, all of our sporting is considered social sport for young people. Uh, and we run on eight week programs as in school holidays, uh, sorry, school terms. 
Um, so parents have no commitment to a full year or a full season of sport. Drop in, drop out, play as many sports as you want. That's uh, And we keep them as low cost or no cost as we can. It was things like having access to not only phone charges, so you could charge your phone after school so you could contact mum or dad, it was things like having um, tracking monitoring device charges available for our young people as well so that um, they were able to get to where they needed to be the next place safely. Um, part of the implementation stuff that we had was making sure we had the right staff. So right people, right place, right time is our mantra. Um, and the consistency of funding provided by government allows us to ensure that our staff have some longevity. It also allows us to... Um, professionally develop our staff in appropriate ways that we're constantly changing and expanding our program. As Sally said, part of the big thing for us is keeping the voice of the youth at the centre of every decision we make and they have a very loud and very articulate voice that is heard. Um, in that particular photo, that's our young people meeting the youth amb youth, uh, United Nations Youth Ambassador um, who was quite surprised at how um, articulate and passionate our young people were about making sure that they were heard. <laughs> um, we have a theme that we call Survivor. We bring in short-term activity providers for four weeks and the kids will vote that provider off very quickly if they are not appropriate and they are not interesting and engaging. Um, so the kids are very, very, uh, sorry, young people are very vocal about what is an appropriate activity. Um, we have brought activities in that we thought were sensational. Rachel spent many hours building a mini golf course, which the kids destroyed in 15 minutes and hated every aspect of it. Um, they didn't like mini golf. Um, but we do work around very appropriate activity providers and ensuring that they meet the needs of the young people. So we do dot democracy, where our young people put a dot up on the wall for different activities they want. They do the meal planning. They do the playlists, which is the bane of my life. Um, and music is changed on a weekly basis for what the young people would like to hear in the space. They set the meal, um, which is COVID actually turned out to be a bit of a positive for us. We uh, pivoted to an outreach model with the help of government who supported us with transport. Wi-Fi, the digital disconnect was huge for our young people accessing information. Uh, so we were able to go out to where our young people live, uh, which was a massive, massive shock to many of our mentors in that some of our young people didn't have a fridge in the home or electricity turned on in the home. So our meal planning became quite different around being able to provide food that could be taken home if needed, but equally come and cook in our space and you can take a food pack home. So COVID gave us the gift of family feed Fridays, which needs a better name. Uh, and we now cook every Friday night with our kids and our families and they're able to not only learn some skills in cooking, but they can take that food home or they're equally able to come and share a community dinner with us, which is awesome. Um, so we constantly are const constantly checking back in with our funders, um, our uh, collaborating partners around Larrakia and our, um, our security team and then making sure that our activity providers are changing. Um, our planning sessions with the kids are fantastically fun in what they're going to deliver. Uh, our Nerf Wars have become a staple of our school holiday activities, um, and there may or may not be a pool noodle fight coming in the next school holidays. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, and the other growth that came out of that was the kids' need for connection during COVID. Um, so we created an online esports platform so um, our young people were connected online, which has now turned into a whole venture where our young people are now driving an esports collaboration uh, and gaming, which we now do on Friday nights. Um, our data capture and analysis has been sensational because our young people will walk around with an iPad on a Friday night and interview each other. Um, and they ask the card questions like, do you feel safe? Um, what else would you like to see? And, and sometimes it's not what we think they want to see. Sometimes it's very much a, a, it takes a left and we're learning to take that feedback on and implement that feedback, which is sometimes the harder part is finding the workaround in they would like something delivered um, and how do we make that very risky activity be safe? <laughs> um, and carry the level of risk that they would like, um, but equally making it safe for everybody to participate. So we, we're constantly reflecting, revising and, and amending the program on a weekly basis. And then when those young people have suggested something, 
we will also celebrate that win with them. We will celebrate every single win we can take on, on a micro aspect to the big ones. It may be a young person who had been making some bad choices, uh, not so great choices, who may stay in the space when there may be a fight outside, which is a realistic aspect of some of the young people we work with. If that young person chooses to stay inside and shoot hoops, that's a win for us. Um, and we will take those wins every day. Um, quick story to share on a just amazing level. We've got a young person who connected with Palmerston Tennis who come into our space um, as a co-collaborator and that uh, one of our young people who had not been making some of the best choices uh, discovered they like tennis and he'll be now going to the Australian Open in um, January. I'm just about to jump up our TV's decided to turn off. Um, Um, sorry. Uh, so, and from that pathway, he just met Palmerston Tennis and it was those, those collaborations. And one of the big things we say about Palmerston is we don't have any patch protection. These are our children and our children go between shared spaces and our children have contact with many, many agencies through their day. Um, can I have another slide, Helen? Sorry. So, yeah, we have a look at, um, about 17,000 young people through our space each year, and those people have access to multiple, multiple agencies, um, which has been the uh, the success of the program. Um, and Helen, I'm not sure if you want to go to that last slide to capture those kids, young people's voices or whether we're going to miss it, but... I, I reckon we'll give it a go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's that so one. So not that one, the next one. Is there sound, Helen, or you want me to just speak to them or? Yeah. No, no, no sound? sound. Um, so we go to young people uh, uh, and we regularly interview and just check and ask for quotes because it helps with our funding. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that kept coming back to was play. They come to play. They come to be young people. Um, we refer to our program as the circuit breaker. They may have had a terrible day at school and they may not be going to such a great home life, but we're the circuit breaker. Just come and play, hang out with us. Um, and the young person that spoke at the very end that um, nearly broke my heart was when I said, what's your favourite activity? And he said, I don't mind as long as it's with other people. He just, he comes for the social aspect. Um and the theme through all of the kids I spoke to on Friday night was play. Um, and it was really lovely to reinforce why we do what we do. Well, thank you both. I'll just stop the sharing. Yeah, th thank you so much. That was just so heartwarming and wonderful. And I, I don't know how much people could hear of the last little bit, but we tried to put some subtitles in there. But yeah, that that last comment is is so heartwarming as the, all, all those stories and the, the concept of our. So um, I'll hand over to Hiano, who I think will have um, some similar stories and um, a, a slightly um, different perspective. And yeah, so welcome Hiano. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my uh, screen with you guys. Um, yeah. Some reason it's not letting me share my sound. My, uh, maybe that's why. No. Technology's stepped in. Anyway, I will um, track on. So, um, thanks for having me. Can you guys, you guys sing that one? Yeah, perfect. Uh, play, Poverty, and Participation. My name is Fayano from the Australian Institute of Play. And just to, again, like to acknowledge the country I'm speaking to you from, the Jarabara country, and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, and, and which I'm, I work and play, and elders past, present, and emerging. So, um, play, I really uh, was excited to have this opportunity to speak to you on this topic. It's, uh, I often think of poverty um, uh, as, um, I often wonder how poverty is perceived by children. And um, in, uh, I grew up 
um, in um, an area that was poverty. Actually, um, Alex, uh, in your uh, slide, the original slide, I, I actually I remember both of those. I grew up in Salisbury in South Australia. That was my home turf. And I, I didn't think of myself as living in poverty, although the, the colours show, show that I was. Um, and um, I, I think when I got older, I, I started to realise that the, the social status and the, the stratification stuff. Uh, maybe it showed up a couple of times in my childhood when, you know, I tried to get a pair of Nikes and uh, that was never going to happen. You know, it was just going to have to be Kmart K226s, whatever they were called. Uh, but, yeah, they are. Uh, um, I'm just gonna, I wanted to show you this video, but I can't share the sound right now, so it's going to be pointless. And I wanted to talk to you about what this video, though. Uh, I work currently in uh, Eagleby South, largely in Logan, and all around Logan, but I wanted to show you this particular video of, of, a, of, a, um, of, a, of a, a, a community backyard called Jumanji Land. And the children of the community called it that, Jumanji Land. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the two previous speakers, Rachel and uh, I've forgotten the other person's name. Sorry, I'm terrible with names. The, the child agency that you guys fostered there is amazing. Thank you. And um, yeah, that's incredible to hear those stories. And these, we hope these guys have feel a similar level of agency, uh, and it definitely seems to show up in, in terms of their play participation. This is a community backyard, a community backyard in by any definition. Uh, there are only five of them that I'm aware of in Australia, only one in Queensland. Um, there's only, uh, I think, two in Victoria, uh, three in Victoria and one in New South Wales. Um, a community backyard is free for the community to access. They provide supervision play that are play workers and it's a big huge adventure playground full of stuff junk there's not really any fixed play equipment there's no monkey bars no slides well there are slides but they're detached and kids can move them wherever they want and um and uh, they can build and create and construct whatever they want they build all sorts of things in there i've seen maternity hubs built i've seen uh hotels there's a currently a hotel in there at the moment it's got seven rooms it's it's pretty impressive um and uh it's being completely managed by children and you can book a room actually you can't book a room it's booked out for a long period of time uh it's it's pretty it's a pretty incredible place um but before i get too much into that i, I I'll, I'll i'll add a link you, you can go and watch this video um it's on youtube uh, i'll add a link in you can um yeah so you can go check it out yourself it's pretty impressive um, and it's one of my um, things that, that I'm most proud of being part of. Um, but a little bit about this story of this community. Uh, but before we get there, I'll just um, um, oops, it's going to try and play it anyway. You guys, can you hear that? No. All righty. Move on. Um, a, a little bit about me. I wanted to share a bit of a story, my story, because um, it talks about play. And I didn't, like I said, I didn't actually realize I was growing up in poverty until I got older. And um, I am a, a former child, um, still very childish, as my children will tell you. Um, and um, I want to make the point that play saved me in, in my childhood. And I didn't realize that until I got older. Well, I'm a community member, I'm a villager, and and for the sake of my children and the children in my village, I take those roles very seriously. Um, and I probably, in, in most relevant qualification, is I'm a father of four. And so I understand the challenges and barriers of raising children in this modern society. Um, uh, so... How did play save me? Uh, play, um, and as a child growing up in a low socioeconomic area, um, I experienced large amounts of joy, large amounts of freedom, independence, connection and belonging, uh, risk-taking, uh, physical mastery, confidence and competence. These are things that I could do on my own volition. Uh, I, I grew up probably under lots of neglect, and um, uh, although I didn't realise it at the time because I was too busy having fun. Uh, with all my friends in my community. Um, it 
also reduced um, my exposure to negative home stresses. That um, and it, it relieved me. It, it provided that relief of distress to me, relief from distress to me. And uh, I experienced lots of states of flow. My days would fly by. Um, I I still recollect having to bolt home really at the, as the street lights came on because I knew I, if I didn't get home for dark, I would be in trouble. Um, there's lots of rejuvenation, um, opportunities for rejuvenation, lots of opportunities for regulation. Um, and when I, I, I feel like it would have been good for my mother in particular uh, to see us come home happy and exhausted and elated from our days of adventure, um, uh, you know, despite uh, all the other challenges that my family is experiencing. Um, but I hear this saying quite often now. Um, I, I just want to talk to you. I, I, before my background, I was in outdoor education for about um, uh, 10, 12 years. And then I went into Nature Play Queensland. I got involved in play advocacy for children, outdoor free play for, for children. And um, I ran Nature Play Queensland for its first six years. In that time, I traversed uh, all, most of Queensland, the regional parts of it and I got to listen and hear to all the stories and barriers for children to access play and um and, and, and I'm talking about child-led free play when I talk about play and um the barriers largely do differ from community to community that's what I uh, but there are some commonalities and uh, um risk aversion in ch in childhood is one um, and uh, also um, stranger danger and traffic concerns tend to be con um, common across most urbanised or largely built up communities. Um, and then you, uh, there's, uh, but they're, 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 they're the most common ones. But in the low socioeconomic areas, we have, um, in, in terms of poverty and, and play, I, it tends to be largely about people not trusting the community, in the one that I'm currently working in, Logan. And parents won't let their kids outside, and this isn't um, just a Logan problem, but uh, uh, it's actually a global problem uh, for uh, lots of people. Uh, not everyone, but lots. And um, this this challenge, though, in in Logan, has some warrant. There are some dangerous parts to what's going on in these communities. Um, just to quickly define play uh, in terms of what it is. It's child-centered, and I'm talking about children from, you know, pretty much, I don't know, when they get a, four years of age till about 14 is when they stop thinking of themselves as a child, generally speaking, sometimes, sometimes it's younger, and they stop thinking of themselves as children and stop thinking of themselves as players. Um, adults still play. We just tend to call it different things. We call it adventure, going on holidays. Some people call it work because it is freely chosen, self-directed, intrinsically motivated, and you're autonomously doing it. Um, yeah, so they, these are, uh, you know, it, but for children, it's, um, yeah, those opportunities for freedom, for unstructured, out, uh, well, not so unstructured, it's unstructured from the fact that adults aren't organising it. Uh, those opportunities for children have been largely reduced. Um, this famous psychologist that plays the work of childhood is the mechanism built into our species to practice trial test master all the skills we need to grow into functioning adults. Um, and, um, and that's what's been largely reduced. And, and most species on the planet play for that exact reason. And uh, we just, as humans, have complex brains and we need adults to look after us for much longer than most species. Um, so we play for longer because our brains are so complex. And so play is so critical for um, all those um, uh, developmental areas to be honed, mastered, and filled. And yeah. Um, just to give you a bit of the ANDC data, you, know, you can see these are the, um, the community that we're working in at the moment. And, and the, the, the level of developmental vulnerabilities in these communities is, is twice the level of, of just general Australians. Um, and, and that's, so that these things are, are uh, it's just just to highlight that um, you know, this community it has, and, and, and it is just because where they live are, are disadvantaged. It's, it's, it's quite unusual. Um, and just to reiterate that this is a global problem. You know, this this um, uh, 
you know, ch childhood is undergoing this different cultural shift from being largely outdoors and unstructured and um, free and all senses engaged. And 73% of my generation played outside more than inside, and now it's only 13% playing outside more than inside. And if you look at when this data was collected, it was 10 years ago. And uh, we've retreated a lot more indoors since then. Um, the house is a virtual leisure palace. Uh, and so, you know, if you want, most, well, I, I actually dread summer holidays for your childhood because it, for a, many children, they don't get to go outside their bedrooms and they don't want to. And, um, and it's largely because they get um, the 4X, which is what they're searching for, fun, freedom, friends, and fluency. They can get that all online with video games. Um, so, and, and people in those socioeconomic areas, they tend to stay inside more than others. And that's largely to do with um, the cost associated with activities, as has been um, highlighted. And, and most most people in, in, in Eagleby, they can't afford outside school health care. So they don't even bother offering it at these schools uh, for those reasons, because they know there's, there's no service providers going to come in and try to offer it when there's no one's going to take it out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's uh, and this also shows you how childhood has shifted. This slide here is um, four generations. It's, it's done in in um in Sheffield in England, but uh, I think most people can relate to this. As uh, there's four generations, one family at the age of eight, and their roaming distance, how far they could roam. I mean, there's lots of things that have changed and, and influenced and impacted on the, the reduction of childhood uh, roaming distance. But um, you know, what we've seen is you know, uh, people's sense of community coming from hearsay, not direct experience. Uh, people's connection with each other and where the people they live around gone. The, the, you know, most people, I think it's um, only two out of ten people now know their neighbours uh, and can tell you who that, that there's children around them. Um, so, and, and kids need other kids. They need them. They need other children. They need to be able to play where they live. It's actually United Nations Rights of the Child, Article 31, says all children have the right to play. And they should be able to play where they live and participate in the community. And most children now aren't allowed outside their front door. He's another professor who says he's going to do that too. At least three in the world. We don't have in terms of children being able to independently move around. And, 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 and I know this isn't a story for all family children. And there are communities where kids can still run and, and, and have this. They're free. Uh, but, uh, what are the perceptions of the community of those children in the communities where their kids are still running? And are we as a society tolerant of kids being out in the community and playing? And um, uh, that's 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 the question that I see. Um, that there are some of the barriers, you know, there's a stigma now around children being out in the community and playing, and then that's not okay. Kids need to be out in their community. Um, and and uh, just in terms of um, some great data as well, the World Health Organization in 2019 um, ranked Australia 140th out of 146 countries in terms of our children's physical activity levels. So only one in ten children, apparently, according to them. Uh, are getting enough physical activity, and um, they issued a global emergency on children's physical activity. That was in 2019, and then guess what happened? COVID hit, and we all went inside and sat down for two years. Um, so, and the community is only just starting to reemerge in some ways. Um, this also study was done shows that you know, uh, in uh, it was uh, about a thousand five hundred and something children, 11, 12 years age, and most of them spent. A majority of eleven of them sat for eleven hours per day, uh, and that's two hours more than adults. So kids are actually doing more sitting than adults, and so um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And, and, and in terms of physical activity, and and um, and I get to the play policy part in a second. Uh, you know, uh, Queensland government did this brilliant research: five thousand homes, they over five thousand homes they surveyed across all demographics around children's physical activity budget. And guess what was number one? Um, in terms of physical activity for children, active play, active play. Uh, but they only do it for 194 days a year, which is like 50 something, 54% of the year. So there's a bunch of years, days of the year they don't do active play, according to their parents. And then you get 60 minute, minutes of it a day. Um, and number two was household chores in terms of physical activity. Number three was swimming pools, if you're lucky enough to have one at home. Um, and then uh, right down at number 17, you get your first sport, uh, number, which is soccer. Uh, and so, but in terms of policy and, and, and government funding, uh, all of it goes in terms of activity, 
it all goes to sport largely. I used to run Natural Play Queensland. It got defunded, uh, um, you know, despite all the great work it was doing. Uh, and so now it's Queensland state government um, gives zero funding to play. So uh, it's it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So in terms of policy and play, I think for children, um, and in, in it's, it's largely from seen and not heard. It's gone from seen and not heard to not seen and not heard. So kids largely sit indoors and no one even knows they're there. You know, so you've got to go up and make sure they're breathing while they're playing their video games. And then you give them some food. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's become an indoor childhood. Uh, and we've got them under a polite form of household arrest. And, uh, and, and it's having a huge impact on our children's health and well-being. Um, so this is why I'm so passionate about this stuff. And uh, um, But in Logan... Uh, I'll get back to this story and I'm making sure I've got enough time to cover this. Um, we've been doing um, a huge amount of work on, on, on this. This is our Logan Play Action Plan. It's a community co-designed process. We had um, 84 community members come in and be part of this. But before we even started, we went and consulted with 199 children on their play and uh, what were the barriers, um, what were their, um, um, uh, what did they like to do, to play, um, what would they like to see? Can they play in their neighborhoods? That was interesting. Most kids didn't even know what a neighborhood was. I had to give them a definition. And we're talking children, you know, uh, and, you know, on average, we're about eight to 12 years of age. I had to give them a definition of neighborhood because, you know, they're going, oh, do you mean, you know, my school? I'm like, no, they no, no. It's, you know, unless you live across the road from the school, I'm talking about where you live. Can you walk outside your house and play? Um, you know, most kids can't. Uh, so they, well, we took what those children told us and we took them uh, to a, an event uh, that we held with the community and we de developed up um, this play action plan, it's a three-year plan, uh, uh, we're, we're at four-year plan, we're in it now at the moment. We're doing some, and this is this is what we've come, what's happened so far. You know, we, we, we'd like to continually consult with children um, we, we are training what we call play workers. If people who don't know what play workers are, uh, they are people who understand the play process for children and they protect that above everything. Uh, the play process is um, the priority and children, so, uh, and, and we're talking about children directing and doing their play. Uh, so play workers are skilled about that. They understand all the, um, the conceptual, theoretical and philosophical frameworks that need to go along with that. And, and uh, we've, um, help establish 11 community loose parts play spaces. Not all of them are like Jumanji Land where you can access them for free. Um, most of them are within schools. There's two within community centres. Um, and, um, and, uh, and yeah, but they are providing good high quality play for children. So um, we've got this audacious goal to make Logan the most playful city in the world. Uh, uh, we're uh, a part of a a collective impact process um, at, with a company called Logan Together. Um, and it's a community development project, sorry, called Logan Together. And, um, and yeah, and we're aiming to reduce the inequities of childhood based on where you live. And um, we feel like it's it's working. It's, it's creating lots of joy, lots of physical activity, lots of social belonging, lots of connections. Um, uh, and play, you know, it's just incredible at helping children play out what's important to them and, and nurture whatever is meaningful to them. And 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 it's uh, that is really hard to quantify and really hard to measure and really hard to sell to funders and to government departments, uh, you know. But I could tell you stories of young people's trajectories who I am guarantee you uh, are, are on a at this stage on, on an alternative route when they were first came in, just largely by having that opportunity for agency, self-correction and control, and, and control that they are able to foster within those spaces. They come to, this, to Jumanji land because they want to be there. They come a lot. They come often. Um, and oh, actually, I've got some stuff on that. Um, oh, just quickly, I'll show you this. This is a little bit of a shift on the data. Um, now, if you look at Eagleby, in the, the, it's a small community. It's like 13,000 people with two schools. We're working in that community a lot. Uh, if you watch the level of developmental vulnerability, we've been working there since 2018. I hope that our impact maybe had an interest, had a, had a, um, 
an impact on that. We can't obviously guarantee and hand on our heart say that was because of us, but we like to think that we helped contribute to that uh, in, in terms of making legal be a lot more playful. Um, here's what children think of Jumanji Land. Oh, there's some great comments there. Uh, Jumanji Land is everything to me because it's about fun. There's no hitting. So uh, that was their rules that they created. Um, it's a special place to me because every child gets to play and have fun. If I wasn't in Jumanji Land, I'd just be at home doing nothing bored. Someone, one child described it as Minecraft. You can build stuff and you can start from scratch. You know, people will always mention when they've come back to Jumanji Land that um, it looks different. And that's because the kids are constantly shifting and changing everything. They take resources from one side of the place and turn it into another, something else on the other side. Um, yeah, you can see there on the right there, uh, there's a little girl cutting something. Um, that's a baby. So babies became a big part of the, a play frame in Jumanji Land for a couple of months. These kids built a maternity hub and gave birth to babies, multiple babies, every play session. And, uh, you know, they were explain, <laughs> exploring all parts of what it means to be pregnant and have a baby and all sorts of things. Um, it was quite quite funny when you, you know, I remember having one discussion and said, oh, are you having a baby? And she's holding her back and moaning, going, oh, oh. And, and I'm like, are you about to have that baby now? She goes, oh, my ovaries hurt. <laughs> I don't think she quite understood what she meant because she was a... Uh, what she was saying, uh, but they were having fun exploring those concepts, you know, making and, and those those play games and play frames went on for ages. Um, so yeah, there's lots of lots of great things, lots of things around that freedom to move. Um, yeah, it's 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 it, it means lots of things to people. Uh, having stuff to fall off, you know, and be dangerous and and take risks, having a safe space where they feel like they can do that, it's 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 brilliant. Um, there's some data in there around return rates. We have Children who have come, you know, out of the 60 times that we'd run the session at that point, you know, uh, some children had come 85% of the time. Uh, so it was, uh, and it's it's cross-gender. It's not just boys and girls, um, you know, and they do such creative things. And there's another another baby down there, um, you know, and this, you can see the henna art on the hand. That's just mud. They've turned the mud into a henna art. And that was part of a hotel service if you went and stayed at their hotel. You could you could get some some henna out while you're there, you know, and part of the service. It's 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 a great service, you know. So these kids are experiencing large amounts of joy, large amounts of freedom. It's not all fun. They have um, barneys. They argue and they fight, just like normal kids should do. And but they learn to negotiate these things, and navigate them, and 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 um, get past it. Um, yeah, and 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 all this is happening within um, a community, which is you know, for the most part. You know, I've heard people uh, locally refer to Eagleby as, um, you know, they, there's a tunnel. There used to be a tunnel across there. They talked about bricking it up to try and block them off from the rest of the world. And it was, it was a long way in, one way out. It's, it's, yeah, it's got a lot of stigma around it. But, you know, working with the, the, the children there and giving them these spaces, I, I don't think they're immune to that stigma. I think they hear what people say about their community, but they love Jumanji there and they love it. It build, it's building pride for them, building a community, a sense of space and place for them. And I like I like to think that that provides them with some relief from stress from whatever you know uh, challenges and barriers they have. So you know, I'll leave it at that because I'm pretty sure I've gone over time. Thanks, thanks for listening. So that's that's great, Hiano. Can I just I'm I know you're conscious of going out of time, but I think. I don't know if you mentioned this, but I heard in your interview the other day you said that park cost five thousand dollars as opposed to Correct. other council yes. parks. Could you just yeah? That's right. That's right. So I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a whiz bang park down the road from us, and uh, it cost the council seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. They like going around telling everybody how much money they're investing in the community, except most kids can't access it because their parents won't let them go outside their house, um, and they won't access. They're not allowed to go down there because there's no adults to supervise it. Uh, and, and no one they trust, I should say. There are adults there. And uh, Jumanji Land um, is able to hold their attention, their focus. Um, and if we had $750,000, that place would be open five days a week, uh, probably for about five, six years, I reckon, maybe even more. And at the moment, we're only a, we get part, a, a tiny amount of funding from communities for children. Um, the school invests the money in the community because they see the benefits of, of play for their, for their school. Um, and that, 
their, their investment in play uh, has resulted in 65% drop in suspension rates, a 50% drop in behavior-related incidences, a 95% drop in detentions. And so for them, they see their investment in play in uh, after school is having an, uh, a lasting impact on what's going on for the school, uh, for within the education system. So you've got these teachers that can focus on teaching and, and education as opposed to um, managing behavior uh, constantly, which they do anyway, but it's less because the children are going back in the class, engaged, creative, feeling more positive about themselves as opposed to getting into trouble during play rate because they've got nothing really exciting and interesting to do. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation. I could talk <laughs> so, there's so much to these conversations. I don't know if you're able to, um, are you able to click stop share? I think we're still sharing. No, no, I'm not sure. Oh, am I still sharing? Sorry. I'm not sure if Maybe. I can. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we, we you know, as I expected, I, I did sort of plan that we probably would go a little a little over time on the presentations, but we do have sort of ten minutes to have a few um questions. Um, mostly we've had a lot of a lot of comments, and people seem to sort of really um understand these issues and and are aware of these changes that have happened over time and the and the importance of the um removing those barriers. So thank you everyone for your um comments, especially um Paul. Kugius has um, had a couple of comments in there about those sorts of things. Um, a couple of actual questions that were um, whether we know if children's screen time relates to adults' screen time. Is that something any of you would like to comment on? Or? Uh, the are, short you going, oh. are you going for it? Yeah, I was going to say the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Um, though there's, there's household normative factors and a whole range of other things, but um, someone else can jump in. Yeah, I mean, that's that's probably all pe people do need to know. I guess people would expect that and it's a little bit, um, yeah, it's it's uh, that's, it sounds like um, we don't need to go too much into that. Um, also, um, this issue of, um, I guess, the, the, the safety around playing outside and um all of your work is about things that are supervised, though. So you really are still talking about um, quite safe environments for, for children. Did anyone want to talk a little bit, um, even if we go back to um, Sally and Rachel, about the way that you work with the, the young people? And, um... So who do we work with? All our, uh, all our um, programs all the way through are um, supervised, but it's unstructured play. So we may play volleyball one day and we may play basketball the next day. So we don't have a set schedule. It's dictated by the young people. During the school holidays where Sally's work comes in and the day is coordinated, so from 9am through to 9pm, the young people are led through our city to different spaces so that their day can be full if they choose to, um, which is the even the transitions between spaces can be supervised. But once they get to those spaces, it's it's pretty well free play. Right. I think it's the same with Jumanji land. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you know, the, the children they just they come in straight after school, and we get kids and parents come in. We ask um, parents if their children are younger than four to stay. They can drop the they can drop their kids, or the kids can come in on their own. And we operate off what we call the three threes: mm -hmm. free to come and go, free to um, do what they want within. The boundaries of the rules that they set, and then it's free to cost nothing. So, um, and when I mean free to come and go, um, we have built up relationships with the family. So, if the child wants to go home, we give their parent a call or a relative a call, and we let them know that it's that they want to go home, and they give us permission to let their child either go on their own or uh, someone will come and get them. And, and so, yeah, so we support those child with whatever decision they want to be. If they want to be there off the day. And we, we rarely get people, kids want to go home. It's it's the opposite actually. Five o'clock comes and we want to go home. <laughs> and and uh, every child wants to play on every part of the stuff that's in there on the way out the gate. And so, you know, so yeah. we um, rarely get out of there before 5.30. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I think this is a question that's probably for Alex that relates to the 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 people who spoke after you. Um, in terms of the the evidence about the free play, the benefit is the, that they are doing, they are connecting with other people um, as opposed to it having to be an extracurricular activity. Is is that correct? Or? 
Yeah, well, I think that I think that here um, part of the issue with the the body of research that we have is that the measurements that we have are relatively crude, at least from a quantitative point of view. Um, and so often when people have done comparisons of like structured versus unstructured activities, it's it's like number of hours per week or, or something like that. And often in those studies, they find that structured activities are better for young people in terms of health, well-being and academic outcomes. But part of the issue with that is that unstructured activities are far more variable. Mm. Uh, unstructured activities is everything from kicking a ball with a mate down at the local park all the way through to um, large groups of individuals coming together and, and, and getting up to some riffraff. Uh, and so I think that the, the short answer is that if there is a space where young people can do things that they enjoy connect with others, um, there, there's merit for, you know, it, it propels their life course in some way. Yeah, wonderful. Well, we really only probably have about five minutes left. So I did say I would just probably finish off by getting each of um, each of you to sort of just talk about something that you really desperately want to say as a takeaway. Um, and there is one question here that if you feel like contributing to, um, and because I think it's it's important in your work whether you've found that uh, how do how do we kind of train adults to be better at facilitating the play and that maybe that happens um, along the way and also those that a little bit maybe about that social capital and the connecting of the the, the adults and the, the families that sort of thing so maybe that's too much but I'll just go around in order that we spoke and um, and then we'll finish up because I'm sure people will have to um, to to leave so um sorry i'll go back to you alex well i think for me often i come to these things and i'm the stodgy academic telling people what they're doing wrong um and you know and i did a little bit of that um uh, as i always will but then to to see individuals who are you know this wasn't planned but but doing some of the things that i think are really important in order to move um you know our our industry and our communities board was really um, heartening. Uh, so I enjoyed both of um, the other talks and thank you so much for the the work that you guys do in your locals communities making a difference. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alex. And I think we will continue to probably work together a little bit and keep certainly keep in touch. Um, Sally and Rachel? Um, I think, um, likewise, Alex, it sort of affirmed the work that we're doing, hearing from uh, from you and your evidence and your um, and your work. Um, I think the takeaway for me is to um, to keep providing opportunities for young people to engage in activities, in play, um, connect with mentors, and um, yeah, just uh, connect with people in their community um, because we know if we keep doing that. Uh, that outcomes will be better for young people and families and communities. Yeah. I think the big takeaway for me is um, one of the comments about not knowing you're growing up in poverty. I don't think our young people realise that they're growing up in poverty and that they're disadvantaged. Um, I think the reality of their daily lives can be quite confronting for other people, but for our kids that's their norm and they are brilliant at adaptability and creating spaces that are safe for them and they have created their sense of belonging around the opportunities that we've been lucky enough to provide them. Um, and I think it is their space and it's it's their ability to create it into whatever it needs to be through play that I've been able to reflect on over the last few weeks looking at this in the putting a lens of play over it rather than the space. The space has been sort of what we focus on, making sure the space is filled, but it's not us filling it, it's actually the young people. Mm -hmm. So I think taking that away that, um, you know, they're the driving force behind everything we do, which has been pretty amazing. So I have to go give them all a hug this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> we all like to. Yeah, piano. Uh, yeah, been, uh, it's, it's always fantastic to hear um, the more research has been done in this in this realm and 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 um, and the evidence um, is still building. So thank you, um, Dr. Alex O'Donnell. And, and and it's amazing to hear that those stories of, of, of child agency and um, being fostered up there in Palmerston. Well done on you guys. That sounds like an incredible program. 
Um, um, in terms of how to support play, uh, there's a fantastic discipline called Playwork. Um, I, I think that's uh, I'd look that up. It's a it's been going since the 1940s. It started in Denmark when they built um, when um, the industrial revolution kicked in. They built playgrounds to um, as out of sympathy for children moving into cities from regional areas because they felt sorry for them, having lost all their freedom of being able to roam around and in, in, the, in the bush. Um, and then they quickly realised that those playgrounds were static and boring and the kids didn't want to play on them and they went, they, the kids would rather go to the rubbish tip and play there. And uh, so they built these junkyard playgrounds in Denmark and, and they have thousands of these all across Europe now. And we only have five in Australia. Uh, so we're still catching up. So playwork is a, is a philosophical framework and a concept that's been going quite a long time now. A lot of uh, rigor and um, and in, in those concepts and the philosophical frameworks, so I I'd highly recommend that anyone go and check that out. This is, is a great platform. That's great. There's like quite a few links and things. Uh, just to confirm, we have shared the your video in the chat. I've shared a few other things. Mm -hmm. it is, um, just to wrap up, it is um, anti poverty week. Um, has is actually for two weeks this 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 year. So it's anti poverty week this year. So I put the website in there. Have a look. There's lots of interesting talks. Um, also, it's Children's Week this week, and the theme is around that right to play. So go and check that out. I put, put a couple of other things, specific things in there that are related a little bit to this conversation. Um, but I think just um, just to wrap up, we sometimes use this word poverty proofing, and that just raising that you came you raised this issue at the end there of of people of young people and children not necessarily knowing that they're in poverty. So if we can have some of these supports around, of course, we want people to advocate um, to raise the rate, to do things to eliminate um, poverty and inequity. Um, and in the meantime, these we're really protecting children by and, and families by having these sorts of um, structures in place. So I, I was so, so moved by all of your work and really grateful. So thanks, everybody. And we'll stay in touch.